Hello everyone, welcome to Brain Blitz Audios. Today, in this episode of Mind Maps, we're going to be dealing with the 13th chapter asked in the science syllabus for grade 10 students of CBSE. The name of this chapter is Magnetic Effect of Electric Current, and it is a very important precursor to your studies in grade 11 and grade 12. Now, this chapter is very important, and we recommend you study it a lot for your coming exams for grade 10, as well as your future studies for grade 11 and 12. So, in order to safely you know, review this chapter in a short period of time, we're going to be using the help of this mind map. Mind maps are excellent tools for last minute revisions. Now, the problem with mind maps is that sometimes they can be very extensive. So therefore, this video is devoted to explaining these mind maps in some detail. Now, we have a lot of videos on mind maps. You can check those in our link at the description down below. So let's move on with today's topic. Today's chapter, which is very important, is magnetic effect of electric current. Now, remember in the last topic, that is electricity, we talked about effects of electric current. And we primarily focused on heating effect because we were talking about power, heat loss, etc. So we were focusing on the heating effect of the electric current. Now, that isn't the only effect that is exhibited by the electric current. Another effect that is exhibited is the magnetic effect. Now, this has to do with electromagnetic induction and formation of EM waves, but then more of that in grade 12. So simply, it's the formation of a magnetic field when an electric current is passed through it. Now this branch, the origin of this branch was first discovered by Hans Christian Ersted. So he was the first scientist who discovered this phenomenon and he was the most important authority in the beginning regarding the magnetic effect of electric current. So he kick-started the revolution of magnetic effect of electric current. Now, magnetic effect is very, very important in today's life because a lot of our gadgets and technology today runs on this magnetic effect. So in this chapter, we're going to be looking at the magnetic field lines first, which are created by the electric current. Then we'll look at field due to various con current carrying conductors. Then we'll look at forces of forces on current carrying conductors to a magnetic field. Then we'll look at an example for that, which is electric motor. And then we'll look at electromagnetic induction, electric generators, as well as some things regarding domestic electric circuits. So let's move on to the first of our topics, which is field lines. So what do you define as a field line? A field line is basically an imaginary line which represents a field, say electric or magnetic field. It also represents its strength. That means how powerful the field is as well as its direction. Now, in simple terms, you can just write an electric field as the surrounding region where the force of magnet can be detected. This definition is applicable for a magnetic field. Now, this magnetic field and the field lines that represent it will give you two quantities to observe. One is the direction of the fields and the other is the magnitude of the fields. So, it exhibits both magnitude and direction. That's why magnetic field is called a vector. Now, more about vectors in grade 11. So basically, vectors are quantities that have both magnitude and direction. Magnetic field is an example of a quantity with both magnitude and direction. So how do field lines help us to understand the magnitude as well as the direction of the magnetic field? So with respect to magnitude, the field strength depends on the decrease of the field lines. So what this essentially means is that if you have more amount of magnetic field, I mean magnetic field lines in a small area, 
then your magnetic field is stronger. However, for the same amount of area, if you have lesser amount of magnetic field lines, then your magnetic field is considered as weaker. So therefore, a stronger magnetic field is represented with more lines, and a weaker magnetic field is represented with less lines for the same space. So basically, if field lines are closer together, then they have then the field is stronger, otherwise it's weaker. When you're looking at the direction part of magnetic fields, so how does it exhibit direction, then we must know that magnetic fields always run from the north to the south poles. So no matter which direction, no matter which axis it's going through, it goes from north to south. So field lines are also very important to note. And another important to note, thing to note about field lines is that they never intersect. If you were to intersect two field lines together, then at the point of intersection, you would basically have two tangents of force. So that means you have two directions of force. But since the field, but since the magnetic field is a quantity which has a specific direction, then this scenario is not possible. That's why field lines never intersect. If you try to bring two magnets together with the same poles on each side, then it repels because the magnetic field becomes stronger because the field lines do not intersect. They try to squeeze in front of each other, but they do not intersect. That's why the repulsion occurs. So that is how you can understand why field lines is very important in the study of magnetic effect of electric current. Field lines are basically the visual way of seeing how we can analyze the magnetic field and its direction as well as its magnitude. So we've talked about magnetic field and field lines. So we know that according to Ersted's discovery, depending on the flow of current or orientation of the uh, orientation of the current, you would notice a change in the magnetic field exerted. So therefore, let's look at magnetic fields due to various current carrying conductors. So the basic rule is that when current flows through a conductor, it generates a magnetic field around it. So how do we find out the exact shape and the exact area that this magnetic field encompasses? It is dependent on which conductor it goes through. So the first case we're taking is a straight conductor. So suppose you have a straight conductor that is a long rod. So you need to find the magnetic field around this and say the current is going this way. Then we will use what is called as the right hand thumb rule. So in the right hand thumb rule, the important thing to notice that the current is represented by the thumb while the magnetic field is represented by the curling of the fingers. So if you keep the thumb along the current and then you start coiling your fingers, you start curling your fingers, then the direction in which you curl your fingers is the same direction through which the magnetic field is present around that straight conductor. So in a straight conductor, it's very easy to find out the magnetic field due to the right hand thumb rule. So radially outwards is for positive and radially inwards it's for negative. So that's how you can find out the, the magnetic field in a straight conductor. Now, if you were to have a circular loop like this one, then in a circular loop, the current goes around in a circle. So basically, what happens is that we're when you're applying the right hand thumb rule, then you can see that uh, you know around the conductor, the current goes in a circular manner. So something like that. But as we increase the radius, there will come a position where the magnetic field lines become straight. So over here it's getting curved, but at the center you can see that it becomes a straight line. So basically in a closed loop, on applying the right hand thumb rule, you basically get coils of magnetic fields around the conductor 
but then as the radius of these coils increases at the center where this at the center of the loop where the strongest amount of magnetic field acts on you would notice that this magnetic field is actually traveling in a straight line as opposed to a curve so therefore that is the important thing to note when it comes to magnetic field due to a current carrying conductor when the conductor is a circular loop but this is when you have one circular loop what happens if you have n loops when you have n circular loops it is generally observed that the current the magnetic field due to the current increases n times and especially if you look at the f magnetic field at the center it would act exactly as a bar magnet shown here so it will have opposite poles and then it would start you know creating more field lines which are from the north pole to the south pole so in this way you would create basically a solenoid so a solenoid is basically a loop of a circular loop of current which is wound around n times so solenoids are a very important you know invention because these led to the creation of electromagnets because when you put a core inside the solenoid then that core gets magnetized which makes the magnetic field even stronger and since these can be switched on or off they can be used variably and so electromagnets came to be very useful because of the creation of the solenoid so again in the solenoid the same thing is using the right hand thumb rule but then we're using the case of the circular loop but then we multiply that n times so that is the basic to how you can find the magnetic field due to current carrying conductor in a solenoid so in this chapter it's mostly about direction in your higher classes you will learn about how to find the magnitude of the magnetic field due to these you know conductors now so far we have discussed the notion that when there is an electric current I passing through a conductor it exerts a magnetic field around it but then there is another concept which is force on the current carrying conductor in a magnetic field so what does this have to do with it so suppose you have a magnetic field and then you have a straight conductor with a current I so the current I anyway creates a magnetic field due to that current but then you already have an external current so then both the current both the magnetic fields so, uh, sometimes oppose each other so because of the opposition the current carrying conductor has a force acting on it so therefore this force can also result in movement so for example if we have the magnetic field uh, uh, based on that wire moving along the left side while the magnetic field outside is going along the right side then because of the opposition a force is created whereby the magnetic field whereby the current carrying conductor moves towards the right I mean so these are you know the kind of motions that we need to keep track of so how do we identify how the force or motion is acting on a current carrying conductor when it's placed in a magnetic field <clears throat> so for that we use the Fleming's left hand rule so Fleming famously described the left hand rule as an effective way to identify how the motion the direction of motion is dependent on the direction of field and the direction of current so suppose your field is along the index finger and then the current is along the mid uh, along the <laughs> middle finger then the thumb represents motion when the hand is your left hand is represented like so so therefore this method is very effective at finding out the motion of an electric conductor when it is placed in a magnetic field and it has a current I passing through it so Fleming's left hand rule is very important because it gives us the idea that the direction of force is proportional to the direction of the magnetic field as well as proportional to the direction of the current I so 
using the Fleming's left hand rule, it becomes easier for us to identify in which direction the, the conductor is going to move when it's placed in a magnetic field and has a current I. Now, now this motion due to a magnetic field of a current carrying conductor can be used for various aspects. But one of the most important aspects that we humans have been using it for is the electric motor. So the electric motor is basically a rotating device that converts electric energy to mechanical energy. So in the electric motor, we basically, we use the concept of force on a current carrying conductor due to a magnetic field. So in an electric motor, we have a magnetic field which is induced by two poles, two opposite poles. So a north pole and a south pole is placed on opposite sides. So therefore, a, a magnetic field is placed across a coil of wire. And this coil of wire is connected to a battery and a switch. So the battery gives you potential difference. And because of the potential difference, current flows through the coil of wire. So the current passes through the brushes into the, co into the coil of wire. And then after it ends its circuit in the coil of wire, it goes back to the other brush and then back to the original circuit. So now current is passing through this coil and you have a magnetic field. So therefore, you must have motion. So in this case, it's rotatory motion because uh, on one side, the uh, coil is going down on the other side, the coil is moving up. So therefore, the torque due to the coupling of forces, it causes rotatory motion. So this occurs as long as you have a stable connection to the potential difference source, which in this case is the battery. So therefore, you know, an electric motor, it helps us to convert electric energy to mechanical energy. So basically you can convert the energy in a battery to motion. So for example, in electric cars that use motors, the electric energy in the battery is transferred through the motor and then it just transferred to the wheels, which makes it go. So that's why electric motors are very important. So the, as current is passed through the coil in the magnetic field, the force ensures that the coil turns inside the magnetic field. So <clears throat> in order to make this uh, electric motor function better, most advanced motors use an electromagnet and you have multiple coils of wire in order to <clears throat> improve the effectiveness of effectiveness of force due to a magnetic field. And then finally, the commutator rings will also be aligned properly and the brushes will be, you know, of high quality in order to ensure that the electric motor functions smoothly. So that's the basic idea about the electric motor. It's basically working on force acting on a conductor which has current passing through it due to an external magnetic field. So because of that, we, find we can have many uses for this electric motor. We can use it to power fans. We can use it for automobiles, etc. So <clears throat> this was an application of how force is acted on a conductor with current I when it's placed in a magnetic field. So we know now that if a magnet exerts force, the current carrying conductor is moving. But what happens if you have a conductor in a magnetic field and you try to move it and the current does not have any current already? If you start moving it, according to Michael Faraday, you would start inducing current inside that conductor. This is what is called electromagnetic induction. And it was first discovered by Michael Faraday. So if a conductor without current is moving in a magnetic field, then current is generated in that conductor. 
So changes in the magnetic field results in induction of current. Now, how do we find out the direction of this in, you know, induced current? We use the Fleming's right hand rule. So when we keep our thumb, index finger and middle finger in this setup, then you would notice that the thumb represents movement of a conductor. The magnetic field is, represent, is represented by the index finger and then the direction of induced current is represented by the middle finger. So therefore, <laughs> Fleming's right hand rule is a very effective way of finding out the direction of induced current. Now you notice that you might get confused with the Fleming's ref left hand rule, but then the basic difference between the two hand rules is that Fleming's left hand rule is applicable when you already have current and you have a magnetic field and you need to find the motion of the conductor. Here you know the movement of a conductor and you know the magnetic field of the conductor, you need to find the direction of the current that is induced. So the term induced would help you differentiate whether it's right hand or left hand. So in left hand rule you already have current passing through, in right hand rule the current is induced due to electromagnetic induction caused by movement of a conductor in a magnetic field. So electric, electromagnetic induction is also a very, very important part of modern age science because through electromagnetic induction, we can actually create electricity for our use. And this is done with the help of an electric generator. So an electric generator is eerily similar to an electric motor. So you have two magnets which create a magnetic field passing through a coil of wire, but in this case, the coil of wire is connected to a circuit and the circuit doesn't have a potential difference. So the circuit just takes current away from the coil. So this, and in this case, since you're generating current, you are basically adding slip rings instead of split rings. If you're, if you're looking at the earlier diagram, the rings were split like this. So that current flows through with the same polarity as the uh, conductor moves along with the magnetic field. But over here, you have two separate slip rings. So one ring passes on positive charge and the other ring passes on negative charge. So therefore, the induction of current is effectively transported through the use of slip rings and commutator brushes. And if you are using a closed circuit, you can always use a galvanometer in order to measure the amount of current that is getting induced. So here, using the process of electromagnetic induction as the coil is moved by hand or using any other source of mechanical power, you would uh, see that the conductor moving in the magnetic field would generate induced current. So therefore, an electric generator converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. Electromagnetic induction is the main source of power in all of our renewable energy sources. For example, hydropower, wind powered, um, electricity, etc. So if you're losing, if you're looking at wind energy, if you're looking at hydropower, then both of these kinds of renewable energy sources is heavily dependent on electromagnetic induction. So electric current is produced in this generator and then the current is taken out of the generator and then supplied to the external grid. And this is done due to the rotation of a coil of wire inside the field. Now in an electric generator, if you have multiple coils, then that makes the function a lot smoother but that means you would have to add more slip rings as well, so that also increases the amount of current that is taken out. Usually electromagnets are used instead of regular magnets because then you can alter the amount of magnetic field that is passing through the coil of wire. Now the good thing about electric generators is that you can also alternate the magnetic field by itself without turning the coil, but then that is actually a topic for higher discussion in grade 12, but then the same theory of electromagnetic induction holds true. So right now we're discussing the, philo discussing the point that when a current carrying conductor is moved in a magnetic field, 
then a current is induced inside that conductor. So in this chapter, magnetic effect of electric current, we looked at basically three effects. The first effect is when a current carrying conductor has current passing through it, it will form a magnetic field. The second is if you have a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field, the current carrying conductor exhibits movement. And the third part is when you have a current carrying conductor which has no current moving through a magnetic field, then you have induced current inside the conductor. So these are the three magnetic effects of electric current. Now how do we apply electric current in our daily life? That is with the help of domestic electric circuits. So there are various kinds of electric circuits. You can use electric circuits for research. You can also use electric circuits for power generation. And you can also use them for domestic services, industrial services, etc. So in a domestic setting, the, the most important part is the safety of the consumer. So we're going to be looking at how we can ensure the safety of the consumer using a domestic electric circuit. Now, it, most of us are familiar with various items and gadgets in our home. So if you're looking at a socket wall adapter, most of the time you would notice that there are three pins. So you would have two pins and then one pin is longer than the other two. So the longer pin is called an earth pin and the other two pins can be the live pin and the neutral pin respectively. So these are connected to the live wires and neutral wires and the longer pin is connected to the earth wire. So what are these kinds of wires? The live wire is the wire which, can, which is marked positive. So that means it brings current to the domestic circuit. The neutral wire is the wire that's negative, which means it takes the current out of the circuit. And the earth wire is the wire that is connected to a metal plate in the earth. So live wires and neutral wires are important because they, they are the wires that supply electricity to the circuits within the home. But why would you need an earth wire? Well, the earth wire is actually a safety measure to take care of leakage. Most of our devices, such as refrigerators, toasters, etc., are having metal bodies. So suppose if by chance the live wire or the neutral wire gets damaged, then the electric charge would accumulate in the, you know, uh, in the metal body. And then if you were to touch it, you would get an electric shock if there was no earth wire. But in an earth wire, the earth the circuit is connected to the ground first. So if there is any excess charge that flows through the earth wire towards the earth and away from our hands, so that would give us protection from an electric shock. Now, in the last chapter, you have studied about a fuse. What a fuse is, a fuse is basically a wire that is with a low melting point and it's used to protect circuits. Now, Fuses protect the appliances from two things. One is short circuit and the other is overload. So what are these two terms? Short circuit is the phenomenon in which the live wire gets connected with the neutral wire and because of negligible resistance, a high amount of current passes through the circuit, creating a huge, uh, creating fires and a huge explosion, etc. So in order to avoid this, usually earth wires are used and also fuses are used. So if there is presence of current more than that is required or more than what is considered safe, then the fuse will break, which, it, which protects the appliances as well as the occupants inside. Now, what is overloading? Now, suppose you had a socket and then you put in a plug and then the plug, say, contains 10 extra plugs. If you were to connect 10 separate devices, say a refrigerator, the TV, the modem, the toaster, the washing machine, etc., in the same, you know, socket, then what happens is that all of these, you know, devices are now connected in series to the same socket. So that means they all take the same amount of current. 
So what happens is that the voltage increases. So when the voltage increases according to the Ohm's law, which is V1 plus V2 plus etc. that goes on, so then what happens is that there is more amount of potential difference which forces more current to pass through the domestic circuit which makes the domestic circuit unsafe and it also breaks the circuit. And so fuses, they help here because they, since they have low melting point and high resistivity, they break up before the circuit gets overloaded so that protects us from damaging the circuits as well. So that is how you can protect domestic electric circuits from being damaged. One way is to connect each device to the earth wire which is connected to the earth in order to avoid any unnecessary charges accumulating and the other, it, the other method is by a fuse where the circuit breaks if there is a short circuit or an overloading of devices causing excess amount of potential difference. So that concludes this mind map. However, as an added bonus, we are also including a flowchart of the same chapter. Flowcharts are also effective tools for last minute revisions and they give you the, the topics that you need to focus on in, an alpha, in a chronological order. So when it comes to magnetic effective electric current, these are the topics that we discussed. We discussed the magnetic properties, magnetic field lines and properties. We discussed about the um, you know, formation of electric field due to a solenoid, due to a circular loop, due to a straight wire. We looked at electromagnets, we looked at electric motors and Fleming's left hand rules. That is basically force on a magnetic conductor, I mean force on an electric conductor having a current I and passing through a magnetic field B. Then we have electromagnetic induction, Fleming's right hand rule, electric generator and finally domestic electric circuits and safety measures such as fuse wires and the earth wire. So these are this is, an, this is a flow chart which looks at the most basic of concepts that is discussed in this chapter. So <clears throat> in this chapter, we, all, we, were also, would all, we would have also looked at alternating current and direct current. So in the chapter, there is a fleeting reference to AC and DC current. Now remember that most of the work that you're doing in grade 10 is based on DC, which is direct current. AC current is a more advanced topic which you'll be studying in grade 12 will be we know that because of the two types of current you would have two types of generators a DC generator and an AC generator and you have sources of AC generator and sources of DC generator most batteries emit direct current while car alternators and thermal power stations are sources of alternating current so that concludes this mind map as well as flowchart on the chapter Magnetic Effect of Electric Current. If you'd like to view more of our content, then don't forget to subscribe to our channel, which is Brain Blitz Audios. You can also hit the notifications button in the description down below. So until the next web webisode, take care, stay safe, bye-bye for now.